Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in just about another minute. So we're just waiting for a couple of folks to join us. And really soon we'll be starting. Thanks for your patience. Okay, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the College of Business Administration at Loyola Marymount University for our webinar series, Impact Insights. My name is Nola Wanta, and I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration. We are so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses navigate the changing landscape as a result of the COVID pandemic. We are dedicated to bringing you valuable insights and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond. This series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the Los Angeles region and the global community. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over some guidelines for today's webinar. Uh, as you may see on your screens, uh, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window. Uh, these questions will be moderated after the presentation. Also, please feel free to use the chat window to post your comments. We'll also moderate questions there, but we usually reserve the chat for, for comments for the speakers. Uh, we will leave time for an interactive Q&A at the very end. So please, if you'd like to uh, speak to our speakers, raise your hand and we will unmute you. And just a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So we are very excited to have Professor Jason DeMello and a panel of leaders who help, business, who help small businesses succeed. Um, but before uh, Professor DeMello welcomes our panelists, I'd like to briefly introduce you to our awesome professor. Um, so Professor Jason DeMello is an esteemed professor of entrepreneurship at LMU. He researches new venture teams, inner dynamics of co-founders, pay what you want pricing models, governance board, post-traumatic growth, and so much more. Um, he also co-leads our financial literacy program and is deeply involved in our Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship. He has also won numerous teaching awards, founded a number of tech startups, and he's also a musician, a super cool guy. Um, but at his heart, he is all about helping small businesses thrive and succeed. And so without further ado, Professor DeMello. Thank you, Nola. And thanks to uh, our CBA for putting on this really important series of sharing knowledge and bringing people from the community uh, together with our students, alums, and, and other friends of LMU to talk about important issues in business. Uh, today, I'm really honored uh, to lead a session on a topic that I think uh, couldn't be more important, especially in the, in the day that we're living in. Um, this has been a, a very interesting year, uh, to say the least, and small businesses have been impacted um, tremendously. And, uh, today, what I want to talk about is the future of small business. And, um, you know, Nola shared my background uh, outside of professor, being a professor, teaching, um, and advising small businesses. Um, I like to write about this topic. And really, my interest uh, in writing about small business uh, has peaked during COVID-19. That's been one of the, um, one of the positive outcomes is that I, I really have spent the summer researching um, small business succession, uh, but, but more importantly, employee ownership. And I brought together a panel of people who have uh, helped me on that journey. And one of my favorite things about being a professor is that uh, it makes me a lifelong student. And I'm learning every day from my students who come to class and bring new ideas uh, for, for entrepreneurship, for leadership, for understanding social issues and solving social problems. Uh, but I also get to learn from entrepreneurs and people on the street who have years and years of experience doing things that I'll never be able to do. Um, I get to research uh, with them and, 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 and interview them. And I've spent all week this week uh, on Zoom calls interviewing CEOs of employee-owned companies, uh, thanks to one of our panelists, who I'll introduce in a few minutes. But just learning about different ways that business can be done and ways that business can be done right. And that's really important to us at LMU is, is the social justice side of business. We've been teaching social entrepreneurship 
uh, since the 70s um, in one way or the other. And, uh, you know, our program is founded in that, in that value of making the world a better place through entrepreneurship. So the Fred Kiesner Center of Entrepreneurship has a long history and legacy, thanks to uh, Dr. Fred Kiesner, who I call Grandpa Fred. Um, and, you know, just imagining, reimagining the future of the world that we live in through the power of business is part of the reason I became a professor. Uh, one of the, one of the things that happened this year before COVID was I had a class that was nominated as finalist for the most innovative entrepreneurship class in the country through USASB. And this class entrepreneurial acquisitions was inspired by another panelist that will be joining us, Bruce Staub from Concerned Capital. Uh, he started speaking to my class about this idea of recycling existing businesses, um, as an alternative to starting new businesses. Uh, he's done uh, decades of work in the LA community and economic development in small business lending and helping uh, a business succeed and, 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 the, and the legacy of the owner to be preserved and the opportunity to be passed on to a new entrepreneur. The class that we teach actually uh, teaches undergraduate uh, students at LMU graduate level um, techniques in finance, in valuation, in negotiations. Uh, the class is co-taught with one of our alumni, Ryan Nurnberger, who's pictured on the sailboat with me in this slide. Uh, we, we struck up a fast friendship through sailing, and we actually take our class on office hours, uh, sail, a, a sailing trip, to, uh, to continue that conversation outside of a classroom. Um, but the, the amount that I've learned in this experience over the last three years has really shaped my personal mission as, as a professor. And... Um, and, and has opened up my eyes to what we can do as universities and academics to help uh, preserve really good companies that exist in our, in our country right now and help give opportunity to more entrepreneurs that are coming up and looking for opportunities to work for themselves and to lead organizations. So this class uh, is part of the, the inspiration of this topic. And our panelists that, uh, that, that I'll be bringing in, um, Anthony Matthews from CCEO, uh, Bruce Dobb, and Tomas Duran from Concerned Capital, uh, have really led the work in this space. And you know, in, the, in the ads for this event, I was sharing some, some stats about small businesses and how important they are in our economy. 44% you know, of the US economic activity takes place from small businesses. Uh, they employ about half of our workforce in the United States um, and 2.3 million small businesses are owned by entrepreneurs who are nearing the age of retirement. Um, fewer than 30% of companies that are in this space actually get sold and less than 15% of them are passed on to the second generation. So there's issues of kids not wanting to take over the business for one reason or the, or the other. And this has been painted as uh, in a negative way in the past. And I wanna change that conversation today um, this is really an opportunity, you know, this is a chance for younger business owners, employees, people who have that proactive mindset and have, you know, a little bit of risk tolerance to step into uh, these organizations. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think of it as rather than starting a business, renovating a business. And a lot of companies have amazing cash flows, have wonderful employees. Um, have great customers, and maybe they, they, they just need a little bit of improvement with technology or an investment in one way or the other. And uh, today we're going to talk about those kind of opportunities. So uh, why now? Why have this conversation this summer of 2020? Well, as you probably read, you know, over 100,000, I think 110,000 small businesses have closed permanently because of the global pandemic. And many small businesses have uh, the owners who are aging and approaching retirement are exhausted. We've seen great businesses here in LA. One of my favorite guitar stores closed recently because the owners just simply didn't want to uh, persist during, during this uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty is part of entrepreneurship. And I think we're going to get through this. I know we're going to get through this, but uh, I, I, it's going to take, you know, a different way of thinking. It's going to take new leaders. It's going to take, uh, agile organizations to, to do that. So as we, as we think about how to get through the future, how to get through COVID-19, how to help businesses give that legacy to entrepreneurs who have put decades of their blood, sweat, and tears into their company, give them a graceful exit, give them a chance to mentor and coach and, and transition their company to 
the next generation of owners, create more generational wealth and generational resilience. Um, I'm really excited about this topic. And so I hope that our, our audience will, will engage in a conversation at the end. Um, we're going to start by giving each of our uh, companies, we're going to give Anthony Matthews uh, 10 minutes, and then Bruce and T Tomas will give us a 10-minute presentation on the work they do. Um, then I prepared a discussion format, so we'll talk uh, between the panelists for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for everybody for questions at the end. Um, but thank you all for joining, and um, our first panelist, uh, Anthony Matthews, he and I have spent a lot of time this week on Zoom calls. He's uh, been very generous to open up his contacts of CEOs at employee-owned companies in California um, that are all part of the CCEO network. Uh, so that I can learn more about it from, from, a, from a research perspective. Uh, he has been an active leader in this space for over 40 years. Uh, he has helped hundreds of companies transition into employee ownership and workplace democracy. Um, prior to retirement, he was the vice president and senior consultant with the Principal Financial Group. Uh, he really created a, a wonderful program at San Diego Rady School of Management. Um, he's a, a proud graduate of Loyola University in 1971 uh, and of UCLA in 1976. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Anthony Matthews. Thank you very much. Let me get my screen up here. Now. There it is. Um, hi, thank you so much for the intro, uh, Jason. Um, I just want to begin by telling you that, that back in 70, uh, 78, about seven years out of Loyola, I had uh, I, I, I stumbled into uh, what I thought was an investment banking or organization, but they happened to have this little niche that was setting up uh, employee-owned companies. Uh, and it turned out that the guys that were involved in the investment banking weren't interested in that. Um, and that was the only part of it I was interested in. So it became a career for me that's lasted, as, as Jason said, about 40 years, more than 40 years. Um, and it has to do with, at least it comes from this notion of, of, of wealth and you heard some numbers when Jason was, was speaking earlier. Uh, but the truth is that we have, you know, we have a tendency to think, focus all of our energy on the publicly traded companies uh, because those are the ones that we have all of our 401ks invested in and so on, I suppose. But in truth, the, the privately held companies do account for the, the bulk of, of our productive capabilities. They, they, they don't, you know, um, and, and uh, there's a very high percentage of, of those small companies that are, are owned by baby boomers, people who look like me in some ways, um, that, um, that, that will um, need to find either a market or go out of, out of business as time goes on. So uh, it's something, though, that gets overlooked for the most part because we're so focused on the, uh, the effect on the publicly traded companies. Um, the status report for small businesses, um, they are a significant uh, part of the productive capital of our country. A uh, large percentage of them are owned by people within 10 years of retirement. There's limited op op options for those owners to realize the value of their investment. And since this pandemic has been raising, I think we've seen what amounts to kind of a turbocharging of the dis destruction of these companies. We've lost more and more in the last several months. Uh, everything is just getting that much worse. So how does that affect the wealth that's in the country? Well, it affects it in, in large ways. Uh, the preservation of wealth typically comes from investing in large public companies or investing in other sorts of, of investments like that. But the creation of wealth um, very often and most often comes from successful operation of a closely held business. Uh, the vast majority of, of U.S. wealth is tied to these small businesses that in cumulative form really amount to the, the bulk of the, of the wealth in our country. Um, and that means that the, most of this wealth is not liquid. It can't be traded. It's not on any markets or so on. Um, and that raises some other issues, some major ones interesting for our effort here today, the fact that this means that that illiquid assets um, are hard to value and they're really hard to access. It's difficult for people to use the wealth that's embedded in a closely held business. 
Um, and within the next several years, as I mentioned earlier, there's a very large percentage of that corporate wealth that is going to have to change hands because uh, the baby boomers have in many ways educated their children out of their businesses uh, and also are coming to the end of their careers. So, um, so where is this all going to go? What are we going to do with this vast part of our productive capability and the wealth that it represents? Um, there's some business alternatives out there. Some of them may be handed down to future generations, family businesses. Some might be large enough to go public. Um, some can be attractive to synergistic buyers. They might be accumulated and they might get high multiples from them. Uh, some might be attractive to financial buyers, but the truth is that most of these small businesses are not large enough or, or volume high enough to, to be attractive to many of those buyers. And so most of them, it looks like, will wind up being liquidated. And I just want to say up front, we're going to talk a little more about this in a minute, but that's the most, that's the worst disaster of all. So I'm going to suggest and talk a little bit about a better alternative for many companies which can take the, the fact that their employees have the most to gain by having the companies continue to operate and create deals where the employees can become the future owners of the companies um, through their own activity and through the, the earnings that the companies are, are, uh, are, are making going forward. Um, and, and so all that equity is either going to go to private equity, financial investors, even larger, too big to fail. Most companies fail liquidation or with effort. We think we can get a large, large number of owned employee owned companies. Um, so what is the sharing of um, the ownership future with employees? Uh, how does it work? Uh, well, we can do it either through management-led buyouts or employee buyouts. Um, it's a way to, for the entrepreneurs that, that own these businesses to preserve some of their leg legacy, gain access to all or part of their equity at the same time. Um, the stakeholders, including employees, can be put in a position to compete for the right to take this equity into the next generation of private ownership. Uh, employees can become owners through a number of group transfer vehicles. I'm going to spend most of my 10 minutes talking about this one with uh, significant tax and uh, financial benefits called an ESOP, but it's also possible to use cooperative models, stock purchase plans, management buyouts, all kinds of other variations on this theme with the same result. Um, but I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about this employee stock ownership plan. Uh, it gives employees the, the tools that they need to be key generation uh, in, in, in the future, the key, key to the success of this company going forward. So an ESOP, it stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Uh, an ESOP is a defined contribution retirement plan. A lot of you have profit sharing or 401k plans. They're the same set of laws that govern ESOPs as, as K plans or, or, uh, or profit sharing. Um, but, but ESOPs have two really significant differences that make what they do possible. One, unlike the regular companies, uh, the non-ESOP companies, uh, where the profit sharing and so on is forbidden from investing in the company's own stock, the ESOP is required to invest in stock of the company that sponsors it. So your company stock is it's a primary investment that an ESOP is allowed to make. Um, and second, um, unlike any other pension plan, uh, it's, it's uh, excused from the prohibition of entering deals with its own sponsor. And so an ESOP can borrow money using credit of the company to do so. So the ESOP is allowed to go to banks or otherwise, you, you know, pledge the, the, um, the collateral uh, the, of the company's own, you know, collateral for the, for the leverage and get it. So that means that the ESOP ESOP is in a position to um, create stock, large block stock transfers from existing shareholders or you know, capital raising or other kinds of ways that they can, can, can put that together. And so it turns out that it's a, an extremely versatile tool. It can be used to, uh, for a wide range of financial and employee relation objectives, uh, depending on what the circumstances of your company are. Uh, it can be a very tax favored employee benefit. It can be leveraged capital to help you grow the business and it also can can be an undisruptive business succession tactic, a tactic that can put your, your, your company on a very long-term transaction for the people. Um, ESOPs have a, a, a 
buckets of advantages I'm going to go through in some detail. Um, the ones that we'll talk about today are the financial ones. There's a lot of tax deductions involved. It's a very, it's, it is without question the most tax favored vehicle anywhere in the United States. Uh, it gives uh, tax deductions for financing principal and interest. It, it allows sellers to defer tax on gain. We'll talk more about these in a bit. Um, I'm going to mention this. And in the end, in the long term, these are the most important aspects of, of ESOP ownership in that it changes the perspective that employees have on their company if you do it right. Uh, and it can improve motivation, incentive, create what we call an ownership culture, and basically improve the community pretty dramatically. Um, the mechanics are pretty straightforward. The company establishes the ESOP trust the same way it would establish a 401k plan. Uh, the company either funds out of its own cash flow or it goes out to an outside lender to borrow money, uh, which it then loans to the ESOP so that the ESOP can acquire shares from the shareholders. Um, there is a significant substantial benefit for sellers in that context, uh, sellers that have have, have sold their stock in that way uh, in C corporations are allowed to reinvest all those proceeds in other stocks and bonds and defer tax on the sale. Um, uh, uh, you know, any tax on that would be uh, uh, appropriate for the sale uh, of their shares to the ESOP. So that's a section 1042 rule. Um, and it works very straightforward. You just have that same uh, uh, pattern of lender loan company to trust, trust to shareholders. And then the shareholders are able to to expand their their return by by avoiding tax e eventually if you take advantage of the estate tax rules you can get out of that that capital gain tax forever uh, the second benefit is for s corporations that first one was for c corps if you're an s corp uh, you can um, as, as you know, in an S corp, the uh, uh, the difference between the two is that in an S corporation, the shareholders are actually liable for the tax on any income or profits that are generated by the corporation. Um, and so, where you have taxable shareholders, uh, they pay on their own 1040 uh, based on on how the the um, um, the the uh, plan has occurred. Um, the S corporation, uh, though, that only applies to shareholders. And again, uh, if you've done an ESOP transaction where the ESOP now is the owner, since the ESOP is also a tax-free, uh, not you know, non-taxable entity under Cal under state law and federal law, uh, then suddenly what you have is a non-taxable uh, for-profit corporation, an S corp that is owned 100% by an ESOP, pays no federal income taxes in very limited state. Mostly they, they pay just uh, state taxes. So um, there are a number of questions that are often asked and I've given you answers. So you may, that may save you a little energy in the, uh, the question and answer at the end. Um, adopting an ESOP, even where the employees own 100% of the company doesn't require any material change in the governance structure of the company. So it doesn't impact how the companies run uh, our ESOP company you could walk into them and you wouldn't see that they're ESOP companies by anything because they have all the same operations. Um, ESOPs are uh, more expensive to, to set up because of the engagement with uh, uh, um, uh, valuation advisors and, and many more lawyers and so on. Um, they are more expensive than most pension plans, but by far they're the most inexpensive method for selling the company. There's something that can be done over slow, long periods of time uh, and, and the costs involved are, are very minimal. Um, the ESOP does not require the company to give employees any rights to information or authority. Uh, it doesn't give the employees the right to tell anybody what to do or to manage things. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that you may want to give employees the, uh, in, the engagement to do that, but the law doesn't require it. So we have a whole group bunch of ESOP-owned companies where you could walk in, the employees don't even know that it's ESOP-owned. Uh, they are building wealth, however, because they're getting ownership in the business and it's growing as time goes on. Uh, and then finally, the shareholder in an ESOP is not the employees, even though they have uh, balances in the ESOP trust for all purposes, legal and otherwise, the trustees of the ESOP who are appointed by the boards are the shareholder of record. They're the ones who vote stock. They're the ones who have control over it um, and, and so on. So this is really a potential uh, opportunity for all the parties involved. Um, sellers will get full fair market value for their stock uh, because it's gonna be determined by a fair market valuation by an independent appraiser. 
Employees can get a retirement benefit that in some of the studies that have been done by our friends at the National Center for Employee Ownership and followed up on, but the retirement benefits for ESOP company employees are as much as four times what they expect to have otherwise without spending any of their own money, not risking their own savings. Uh, the companies qualify for those tax and financial benefits. And as I said, they're unequal. There's no other sort of enterprise that has the same tax favored status as these plans do. And overall, the biggest thing that happens, I think, from a, a, from a, a sort of selfish perspective for the rest of us is when you establish an ESOP owned company, it's 100% owned by the people who live there. It's one of the few models where the value and the wealth that's being created stays in the community that it was created in and accrues to the people that help create it. So it gives you a very stable corporate citizen. We find that our ESOP companies are very active in their communities, uh, doing lots of other things, and they just become good, good, stable sources of income. Um, I, I know there are a million questions about these. I tried to give you sort of a gloss of it so that we can kind of get in the right area. Um, I'm, I'm prepared, and, and uh, uh, Jason uh, um, mentioned it earlier, that we can send this off to you, uh, that whole uh, um, set of slides, if you like, and my contact information is there. I'll just give you one last minute on the CCEO. We are a social benefit corporation that was part of the Rady School of Management management at UCSD and got private, got independent when I left. Um, our job is really just to see that people have enough information about these things that's legitimate, that they can make a good decision as to whether they make sense for them. We do free of any charge, uh, a one hour kind of uh, potentials meeting that, uh, that helps uh, companies get there. And we're perfectly willing, anybody that's been to this is entitled to that as far as we're concerned. So this will get sent out later. Um, and um, and that ex that's my bit. I think it was about 10 minutes, but maybe a little over. Thanks so much, Anthony. That was great. Uh, and um, our, next, our next group of panelists are going to be talking about that last point, I'm sure, because that's really where they got my attention on what this does for the community, having employee ownership. And, you know, once, uh, once a company sells or is liquidated, those are jobs. And... Out of, out of the, uh, you know, 2.35 million small businesses in this country, that means 25 million people's jobs are, are up in the air, you know, and uh, that's, that's really, you know, the motivation that I have. And when those jobs are lost, communities are impacted by that. So our next speakers um, are from Concern Capital here in Los Angeles and Bruce Dobb and Tomas Duran. Uh, Bruce has a unique skill set uh, suitable for small business acquisition uh, as a small business lender, um, understanding of tax credit programs and small business manage management. He's been able to help clients navigate funder application, due diligence proce processes, and secure financing. Um, he's, been, uh, he's been involved in government work, working under uh, Governor Jerry Brown's first administration. He helped in the corporate field with American Apparel, helping them get their first debt financing. Um, in LA's empowerment zone, and uh, and he's you know he's just just done incredible work over his career. Um, originally from uh, George Washington University in uh, in DC, Tomas has 15 years of economic development experience in low income communities in Southern California. Applies uh, his background in finance, new market tax credits, and redevelopment skills to help develop creative and innovative economic development solutions for private businesses. Uh, prior to this, he's been a program manager for the Whittier Redevelopment Agency, vice president of real estate for Genesis LA Economic Growth Corp. Um, in, in addition to Concern Capital, he teaches a class, so he's a fellow educator um, over at the Price School of Public Policy at USC. He serves on the board uh, for Common Future, a new tax credit uh, community advisory board for Dudley Ventures Community Investment, and is a fellow in the Aspen Foundation's Job Quality Fellowship. Uh, he has his master's degree in planning from USC. So uh, please give me a warm, help me uh, give a warm welcome to our next speakers from Concern Capital, uh, Tomas and Bruce. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, tag team this presentation. I'm gonna share my screen in a second and share some slides. Um, I mean, before we jump into it, I think it's important. Um, one of the things that we like to share often is that uh, Concern Capital is in the midst of its own transition. Um, the company was started by Bruce um, about 
well, I think far longer than Bruce likes to admit, but quite some time ago. And he's been transitioning over time uh, to me. And as we're transitioning, we're not only transitioning the goodwill of the company, but we're also transitioning the skill set and transitioning um, the relationships and context that each of us have in these different spaces. So give me one second as I work through my little technical issue here. Um, and Intergenerational. I take the old guy sellers and yeah. Moss takes the new guy workers. That's how we, we, we go tag team it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I think the, one of the more important things to, to, to know about Concern Capital um, is that um, we're a social benefit corporation. We're a for-profit uh, corporation. And we basically, we only um, are um, we're funded by the success that we have. We work on milestones and we work with businesses to grow. One of the things that Bruce has done um, in, uh, in his career is figured out how to meet the businesses where they are and address the needs that they have today. Sometimes it's accessing capital, sometimes it's business planning, and sometimes it's figuring out what's next. And what we started to notice when we started doing this work together was that he had a whole group of people within his cohort, within the circle of friends and the places that he was going, that had built up companies that their children didn't want. Their children um, went to college, they wanted to go into music production or, or something else, but they were no longer interested in operating the family business. But the owners were concerned about not only the legacy, but all the people that they had worked with over time. And so we began to work with them to transition those businesses to um, employee groups, to groups of managers, to um, individuals, to people who were concerned about the, the, the business staying in the community. And we eventually started calling these people insiders. And what we've done is created an approach that is, allows for the succession of a business, allows for that ongoing concern to continue to operate, but also value the goodwill that's been generated is continue offering those jobs and create a path to ownership for one or more of the employees that work there. And our ideal outcome would be something like the ESOP or something where uh, employee ownership is democratizing across the board, but that always doesn't, that doesn't always meet timing of the seller. And um, for example, this morning I was talking with the seller who's had a plan for a five-year transition until his spouse um, was diagnosed with um, an illness. And now his timeline has moved up. Um, significantly to about six months. And so he doesn't have the luxury of being able to set up a lot of the systems that he would like to in order for the transition to happen with the um, to the employees. So he's having to do a, a particular um, uh, employee. Um, two, two important notes. I'm a Jesuit educated um, and my son is about to start Loyola High School. And that process has really kind of crystallized why I do the work that we do. This concept of being a man for and with others really drives the um, social mission of Concerned Capital. We believe that we have uh, an obligation to use the God-given talents that we have in service to, our, to our, um, our community that may not have access to those things. And so the, um, that's what you see with us. We also focus on grassroots economic development strategies because we don't believe trickle-down is effective at preserving um, and recycling um, treasure in the communities where it was generated. We want to raise the floor. We want everyone to benefit from that rising tide. So we do things like facilitating impactful investments, creating programming, generating sustainable um, economic development strategies, and shifting of existing resources. Um, Bruce and I are, are constantly trying to figure out how we can use available resources to, to shift a little bit to get a different outcome. Um, the pr uh, <laughs> Anthony's presentation, I think, did an excellent job of describing the mechanics of doing the transition. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the context within which we're operating now. Pre-COVID, it was a challenge because the capital markets tend to flood our communities, especially in Southern California with the proliferation of family offices, with investors that are very well funded and are very fast, and they're able to offer cash or they will offer a very um, low leveraged offer to buy that business. And so when I think about it, if you're an employee who wants to buy that business or you want to transition that business to someone within the organization, the people that they're competing with are going to be more funded, likely a bit more nimble, and they're going to be, if you want to use the analogy of boats, going to be like a yacht team, um, working in, co in coordination, sponsored with a significant amount of funding behind them, and operating on a platform that is very uh, sophisticated 
and requires a number of people to be involved with. But at the same token, if you look at the, in the background of the picture, you'll see speedboats. And these are smaller, less funded competitors or, or their competitors who understand the space and know how to navigate it, but are not gonna be as well funded as the um, private investors or speculators. And then you have the dismantlers who are gonna be following around lurking, just waiting to basically sell for assets. And the employees are going to be the groups out here, like in this little boat back here in the background, that are working together and using sweat equity to try and advance things. And then, of course, you have the liquidators who aren't even on this. They're just waiting for the boat to crash so they can go in and sell it for parts. But the point is, the environment that you're operating in, whether you're a student looking to take over an existing business, whether you're someone who's trying to retire and you see the retirement as your key to um, what's next in life, there's going to be a lot of people vying for any attention and vying for that business, even in post-COVID. Because the economy is, is, is not where we all want it to be. It's crashing and, and there's going to be a lot of problems. But those operating businesses that have a good niche, the ones that have a good foundation, a good platform, that, have the, that, that made the investment into assets are going to carry them through and to the other side of this, particularly in manufacturing. They are very popular right now. And we're seeing a lot of capital investors, a lot, a lot of the private equity, doing a lot of research and trying to get into those spaces because they seem like they're, they're, this is a good opportunity to be in it. But just because there's a lot of competitors doesn't mean that it's a seller's market. What we find is that um, from research from the SBA is that less than 30% of the businesses that are actually listed will sell. And a lot of times by the time a business owner gets to the point where they're listing their business for sale, there's a life event that's pushing that. There's something happening with them, with their spouse, something that's happening that's forcing them to make choices that if they're not able to sell, they end up closing the business. Or they, they end up staying longer and draining the business as it starts to um, 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 get smaller over time. So most of it end up being dissolved, liquidated, or vacated. And then the, the property, the assets that's left, that's what the liquidators will come in and they, they dispose of the property. Um, I work a lot with manufacturers in the defense supply chain. And one of the things they say, the two most common calls that they get are brokers who are asking if they want to sell their business and liquidators who want to know if they want to buy the business, buy the assets of the businesses that are closing. Fewer than half of family businesses continue to transfer. I think the baby boomers were one of the last generation where people really held up that mantle and moved on within, within the business. I think a lot the the notion, especially here in Southern California, that you know going to college and being a professional and doing all these other things has taken a lot of people away from continuing in the family business. Um, it's a hard to sell, it's hard to sell the business to somebody who doesn't know it, right? When you're the due diligence process can take a long time, it can be expensive. And now that you've shown everybody what, what's happening with your books and they may not know exactly who your, con who your contracts are with or they may not know exactly everything about your business, they have a better idea of how you operate. And a competitor may be willing just to pay for a, an opportunity to look at your company and then go in and wait for you to close because you can't sell it to somebody and then pick up your contracts. And so that due diligence process can take a long time. It can be very drawn out. And if you have a life event or something that's... that's um, requiring that you do a sale faster, that's not an ideal op, um, situation for you. And then finally, legal costs. When people don't know each other, when the parties are, are don't know each other, everybody's, um, you know, you, you lawyer up and, and rightly so to protect yourself and, and reduce liability that can come out of the sale. But the biggest challenge that we have found is the owner's perspective on the value of the business and the buyer's perspective. And I love this image that you see in the background of this slide here. You have one person yelling four and the other person said, no, it's three. And depending on which side of this object you're looking at, it's four or it's three. So neither of them are really wrong. But if you only see three, you're only going to pay for three. And what ends up happening is from a business owner's perspective, you're thinking about the value of this thing that I've spent maybe the majority of my life building where I've come in and had relationships with the customers, relationships with my staff, where I've put in a significant amount of investments that may have paid for your houses, may have paid for your kids' education, it may be paying for, for LMU. There's a lot of goodwill there. And that has value to you as the owner. But the third, profit, third party is looking at your profits. And they're looking at it and going, well, what's the multiple that I can apply to these profits? How does this 
these contracts look if I'm operating them. But those insiders, and this is what we love about employees buying it, they will value that goodwill. They will place a value. It may not be at the same value that you are, but they'll be a lot closer than somebody in who's coming in and operating, just, looking at it just for profits. So understanding that it's a competitive market, understanding that it's not always um, uh, uh, the timing is, it may not fit the timing of the seller and understanding that there's a difference in perspective between the person who's selling the business and the one who wants to buy it is key to being able to navigate this process and have an outcome that, that allows for employees or insiders to take control and own this business and basically own their jobs. Because of all those things, we like to um, recommend that people who want to be entrepreneurs who want to get into business to buy an existing platform, buy that existing business, buy that track record, you know, show that, you know, go, they have a demonstrated market, go in there and um, access what's already happening there, become part of that existing thing. Because then once you have control of it, you can change that platform to meet whatever current needs that you have. And hopefully you're thinking, how can I reinvent this existing company to not only be competitive post COVID, but provide me with the life that I want and maybe, and, and continue the legacy and continue all those great things that we had talked about before. So it's much easier to do that with an existing platform where you're just recycling that company as opposed to doing a startup. Usually on this slide, I have, this, I have a, um, an image of an aircraft carrier. Right. And the, the reason we use an aircraft carrier is because if the aircraft carrier is taking the planes to the point where they're going to take off, that's a lot less work for those planes. It's a lot less fuel. It's a lot less wear and tear. And it creates a different way of looking at the objective from that plane when it takes off from that aircraft carrier. And we want you to think about buying an existing business as that platform that's already there to help you be successful. So uh, selling to insiders, and we talked about this a little bit. I'm going to send, hand it over to my partner, Bruce, to, to talk um, in a few minutes. But one of the things that we talk about is selling to insiders are one way to have a successful income outcome. could be the ESOP. It could be a small group of um, employees. It could be one employee. It could be a co-op. But one of those things it does is by keeping that ongoing concern, it protects that legacy. It could be a, a lot. Son or a daughter. It could be a son, son or a daughter. daughter. Son or, yeah but it protects that legacy. It also can be a faster sale because when you're selling something to people who already know about it, who know about all the challenges there within it, you're not spending time negotiating and figuring out that, all that out. The due diligence process doesn't have to last as long. It's like selling your house to your brother. They already know where it creaks. They already know where it leaks. We love it because it keeps jobs local. At the end of the day, Concerned Capital is about creating and saving jobs, saving, creating, and growing jobs. There's tax benefits to the seller. We can talk about that in greater detail later. And then it also can provide a longer transition or a longer uh, runway for retirement. So maybe the, the owner is saying, I don't, I'm not ready to go yet. Maybe I just want to go from full-time to 80 to 60 to 40 to 20 over a few years, but allows that transition because you know who the sellers are for you to exit and also still be involved to make sure that when they take it over, it can, it can be successful. So I'm going to hand it over here to Bruce because there's a few, I talked to you a lot about the context and the environment, but what we really want to do is impart the message about what's needed post COVID or during COVID and post COVID in Thanks, order to boss. be successful as uh, for these transitions. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go through all the slides that we have. We have about five or six more. I'm going to really just hit on these next two, but uh, the, the transition of ownership is a great thing. We got a lot of enthusiasm from employees who think it's a good idea. Initially, I haven't met one employee who doesn't say, long-term employee of an owner who a privately held company doesn't say, if I had the company, I would do it differently. I could make a lot more money. I always hear that. We hear that all the time. Maybe they would, maybe they would. But they, get, well, they want a chance to try. Um, the point is, is that it's very important that the people we work with, whether they're insiders, son, a daughter, an employee group, that they have an idea of what they'll do with that company when they take it over. It's not enough to just worry about the tax consequences and the purchase price and the, all the other stuff. Do they want to run the business as a business? Do they want it to grow? Do they see a path forward? Do they know how to reinvent the company? Reinvention's a whole part of transition of ownership for us. COVID-19 has forced everybody to reinvent their companies. In one form or another, you're going to have to do it. So while you're getting a transition of ownership, you're going to have to adapt to the new realities that we have. Um, 
I did some research on this about ways that it's been done. And there's one story I want to tell you about a personal client of ours that we transitioned that reinvented a company. But uh, you want to talk, go back one second more, Tomas, to the previous slide for just a second. Direct to consumer marketing. People know how that, like American Apparel was a great example. Before they existed, no t-shirt factory in the country sold one t-shirt to anybody. They all sold them in cartons of, you know, 20 dozen. You had to buy a big quantity. He, he said, hey, the internet, why not sell direct to the consumer? Another thing, offering new products is another way to reinvent the company. And making a traditional website mobile friendly is just another way of reinventing the company. So those are some concrete examples. Go to the next slide, Tomas. Let me talk about a little bit about ETO Door. Uh, in downtown Los Angeles, uh, old door distributor, been around for 50 years. Uh, a kid named Tal Hasid, his father took over a building. And he said, hey, there's this... Uh, bankrupt uh, door, manuf door distributor downstairs. What do we do? Let's liquidate the inventory. So Tal looked at it and he figured, well, I don't really know anybody in the door distribution business like Terry Lumber or any of those guys. I don't know how I'm going to sell. He had, I think, 10,000 doors in the basement. He said, but I have a uh, account with, uh, I, I guess it was at the time, uh, Tomas, who sells stuff over online? EBay. 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 Yeah, he had an eBay account. So he figured out he could start selling these doors on eBay. And then he got into the CAD cam dimensions of the doors. And he really reinvented the door distribution business, the door wholesaling business. He now has like 100,000 doors under one roof in downtown Los Angeles. He grew the business like tenfold within three to four years by taking it online. Nobody had ever sold doors online like that before. Um, there's all kinds of examples of companies. You know, uh, Xerox started out just making play paper. They made just uh, photographic paper. A uh, ret retailer, The Gap, the Gap, <laughs> the Gap sold initially albums to kids and jeans. And they realized when they deeply discounted the jeans, it took over the sales in the store. So guess what they did? They went with the jeans. The rest is history. Um, Intiendo is another great story. Intiendo started out with playing cards, believe it or not. They manufactured playing cards. Then you can see how they grew into a different kind of company. But it requires going with new technology and really reinventing the company. And if the people taking over the company have a clear vision of how they're going to reinvent it, in the case of COVID, we're telling people now, maybe your sales was relying on walk-in trade. That trade's gone. You're not going to have walk-in trade. Maybe you have to look at government procurement now. Maybe you have to look at becoming certified as a minority uh, company for uh, procurement purposes, selling to the government. So reinvention is very much part of the current environment. We see transition of ownership as something that's happening because of aging of the population. But with that, unless there's a reinvention idea, it, it yes. you really can't handle those transitions effectively. I don't know. How many more slides do we have here? Tomas, well, just a few more. The, the, just the importance of this one is to show you that there's a yeah. lot of challenges to operate in a business in California. There's a lot of reasons why being in business is hard. But there's also a lot of resources and opportunities and players in this space that want to support that. Um, CCEO Yo, uh, is one of the great players in this space that can help make those things work and make it easier. You're not alone in this mm -hmm. space. Um, then this is just to show kind of the characteristics we work with within the manufacturing communities of the kind of jobs that we look at. I just wanted to show this to, to um, give people a sense of um, this works really well with those companies that are three to $10 million in sales that are completely off the radar for M&A that are just no, the m a doesn't touch it because they, they don't have the kinds of returns or, um, and revenues that they usually want. So it, this works, it um, works for a lot of businesses of this size. And then just the last one is our contact information. Um, so yeah, thank you. We look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Bruce and Tomas. That was wonderful. Uh, some great, great examples. And I love that uh, the story of the door uh, business as well that I remember that was that's what first caught my attention when you came in my class uh, so I, anyway I would like to open it up to the audience we have some questions in here and I'll let uh, Nola jump back in and facilitate a Q&A great thanks so much Jason, and thank you everyone for typing in your questions in the Q&A um, and uh, Mila, I We'll unmute you in just a minute, um, but we'll start with a few questions that came in earlier on. So Margaret had a question. Um, we're the third generation company owners of our company, and our son, also an LMU grad, works for us and would like to buy the company in the future. 
would we be able to use the ESOP feature or is it only if more than one employee purchases the company? Um, <clears throat> hi, I, I mean, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, well, it, that's one of the problems with a compressed pr presentation is you, you kind of gloss over things. An ESOP doesn't have to buy all the stock. It can buy part of any company, any or all. Um, we've done them where transitions took a period of years, and the first year there was only like 2% of the company in an ESOP, and then it grew over time. So, uh, but but you, you couldn't use the ESOP as a vehicle to create one single shareholder because they're required to cover a fair cross-section of employees. They're, they're subject to ERISA rules and other things like that. But I have known over my career a dozen or so companies where the from the financial perspective and otherwise it made sense for the family pur purchasing from the, the the previous generation to use an ESOP as part of the of the of the transaction. Uh, it gets you a, a proportional amount of those tax benefits, uh, and uh, and it also gives easy access to some financing outside that wouldn't be there if you were just doing an internal redemption or something like that. So it can have a role, but it's not going to be you're not going to be able to create an ESOP just for a single or for a small subset of employees. It's got to, got to cover a fairly good, good range of employees. By the way, this is a big problem. This is a big problem. So SBA, which accounts for about 75% of all small business acquisitions, precludes sons and daughters, immediate relatives from buying it. They consider it refinancing equity with their guaranteed loan product. So it's, they do, banks, banks no longer do conventional loans. They all do SBA loans. They do not do conventional it's all your SBA guarantee for acquisitions for the most part in our market. So um, we've worked with a way, uh, we work with solutions to that and it's one or two key employees partner with the uh, um, owner's son or daughter. And usually we can get, we can get over SBA's reg requirements that way. Um, we did a couple su successful deals that way, but it is an issue when you want to transfer to, because obviously owner would like to get some of their money out of the business and like to get a, a liquidity event to happen. It, ma it makes it difficult. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have another question from Andrew. How do external acquirers who want to take over and operate a company fit into this? Will you keep it in the community? Will you take <laughs> the community they're in? Then we love you. Sure. You're going to be guarantee us that, but we really, we, we are economic development people. So our first priority is to keep the jobs local. But Bruce, you guys have done deals with external acquirers. And I think there was another question about a successful small business succession. Do you have any examples of yeah, uh, so company selling to an external? Real quick on the, on the external. Yes. Um, we're actually in the midst of one right now um, in Colorado that's bringing in an external uh, partner to provide equity for an employee group that's going to eventually own the building over time, own the business over time. Um, and every time we do presentations like this, we'll get a, someone from a family office to call us and say, hey, we're interested in investing in an operating business. I, used, I made my money manufacturing someplace else. I live here now. You know, how can I get involved in this? And if we feel like they're committed to keeping those jobs local and it's not just for a capital return, then we're happy to help them and assist because the um, equity to purchase the business is always the hardest to come. And usually what ends up happening, if like Bruce said earlier, if you use an SBA loan, then you have to have 10% of that equity from a third party but, um, and it can't be an owner carrying back a note because then the owner's note gets sub subordinated to the SBA loan and they can't get their principal until the SBA loan is paid off. So then it becomes a disincentive to use the SBA loan and it, it gets complicated. But the point is, yes, there's an opportunity there. Um, second thing, uh, Bruce, if you don't mind, I'll just tell the Ariza story. Um, yeah, sure. One of the businesses we transitioned uh, makes cheese, and they're one of the first Mexican cheese producers in Southern California. Well, the founder um, passed. It was owned by uh, the founder's wife, and the adult children operated it, except that the adult children were attorneys and accountants and doing things that weren't related to the business. And so the business was kind of operating without, um, it was operating without uh, the family there, um, absentee ownership. Well, we helped them transition the business, which met the needs of the, of, of the mom um, for ongoing um, income to provide for her care. It preserved the legacy and provided the working capital needed for the um, workers to take it over and start operating it as their own. 
Well, these guys who'd always wanted to operate this business had a bunch of ideas of where they could start selling their cheese products or additional dairy products they could make using their existing machinery. But the family, because there was absentee owners, didn't want to put additional money into the company. And so the company was stuck. They couldn't buy more milk. They couldn't get the money they needed for raw materials. Once the employees purchased it, started buying and producing cheese, they had um, buyers come to them from all over Southern California who were like, hey, we heard the story. It's wonderful. We love this. And immediately their business picked up. And I think it ended up increasing 1.5 times in a matter of six months. They were on the news. They were, <laughs> they were getting calls from people in El Salvador and in Mexico because they were seeing it on the national, international news networks about how they were able to take over this company and preserve that legacy and continue going forward. So now they went from making four cheese products to I believe they're making eight or nine. They're doing some more Central American uh, um, cheese products. But these entrepreneurs took that platform and started to expand it and, and basically and, and, and kept the name because they wanted to honor, honor the legacy that allowed them to get to that point. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So um, Mila, I see that your hand is raised and I'm sure your arm is pretty tired. Um, so I am going to go ahead and unmute you. Oh, oh, your hand went down, that's okay. I'm sure it was already tired. So I'm gonna um, keep going down some of the questions here that others have typed up. So from Deanna, uh, with businesses leaving California in droves due to financial safety, political reasons, etc. What happens to my investment when these businesses go out of business? What and where is my protection? It's a great question. Yeah, it is great. That, no, it's, it's a great question. It's a very real question. And I think it depends on the kind of business that you're investing in. Um, because in manuf what we see in manufacturing, especially for advanced manufacturing, the story of businesses leaving California, it doesn't hold. And the ones that do leave end up coming back. Because California is hard to do business. It's really hard and expensive to do business here, but we have one of the most highest educated workforces in the country. And we also have one of the largest workforces in the country. And so like, when I talk to manufacturers, they complain about having to go through 10 people to find one good worker. Well, the reality in most of the other countries is you have only two workers to choose from. And so it's a different set of circumstances and a different set of challenges. I don't know that there's any one solution that's going to, project, to eliminate all our liability or um, ensure that your return is going to be solid. I think it's going to require that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're, you're investing in a business that has an idea for where it can grow, what it can do and how it can um, uh, create a niche that's going to allow it to be successful. In Southern California, um, if I was looking to a place money right now, I would place it in the commercial companies that are sending satellites to space. I would put it into uh, companies that are expanding memory and making um, uh, data, data memory um, units that are used in these satellites. I would invest it in advanced uh, machining and manufacturing in aerospace and in defense because everything else is great. And those are, a lot of the other industries are wonderful, but those are the ones that are rooted here and cannot survive almost anywhere else. There's 15,000 manufacturers in that space in Southern California. And something like 80 to 85% of them are owned by people at or past retirement age. So there's a ton of opportunity. You just got to scratch a little bit and figure out where it's at and make sure like Bruce said earlier, that there's a champion that's going to um, do the work that's needed to find those opportunities for growth and have that company, um, help that company reinvent itself. I don't know, I would, I would just add to what you just said. I agree with everything that, that you said, but um, the ESOP ownership is another one of those that puts kind of an exemption on this sort of thing um, because they're in such a tax favored posture to start with and they tend to be very, very stable. Um, in fact, the California ESOPs, there's about a thousand of them around California uh, and they tend to grow by expanding into other places. Um, so we have many of them. One of the ones that uh, Jason and I are interviewing started out as a single place with about 80 employees in Chatsworth, California. And today it's got three locations in you know in Texas and, and uh, Newburgh, North Carolina and 600 employees and you know so on. It's been 100% owned by the employees uh, since 1991. So there, there, it does have an impact on everything and it is more flexible than, than, than sometimes it's represented. 
Fantastic, that's great. Um, we have two minutes, but I think we have time for just one more question, so this will be fast. How do you transfer goodwill from one over to another? Aren't those with whom the goodwill exists often based on specific interpersonal relationships rather than a relationship with a business entity? Thoughts on that? Yes, that's a very good observation. Yeah. But that's also why you need to have that transition and handhold it. So for what we're doing, Bruce is introducing me to all his contacts and allowing me to make that transition and helping me um, uh, establish those relationships so that goodwill can pass on. Yeah, it's not an exact a, science, it, but it works. It, it, goodwill is an accounting term. In other words, basically, when you look at a balance sheet, the first thing a merger and acquisition shark will do is he'll trash goodwill. He says it's worth nothing, and he reduces the balance sheet by goodwill. Well, in that goodwill is the training of employees, in that goodwill is the customer, the vendor relationships you have with other vendors, years of experience, the reputation of the company, the company's brand name is in that goodwill. But merger, because it's not on the bottom line, the mergers and the valuation professionals trash it. Now, how do you translate it? Well, a lot of times you take a per professional valuation, which will zero out goodwill, unfortunately, and you say, okay, we're going to have that, pay that owner for the goodwill in the form of an owner carry. So the owner takes back paper. That's how we get the transition of goodwill to occur. That's oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, a minute. Anthony wanted to say one thing on that. Do you yes, please. I was just going to say that the, the goodwill question doesn't really get to be too big an issue with these subcompanies. They tend to happen gradually over time so that even the outside world doesn't even know it's happening. The transition is happening and, and nobody is even aware of it except for the internal people and so on. And the companies tend to just stay very, very much like they are. So for the accounting goodwill, there are still some changes, but for in general, the whole notion of what you feel about the company doesn't automatically change when we do any something. Sometimes it gets better. You know? Great. I'd like to thank our panelists. And uh, th this was a really informative talk. Uh, again, as a, as a professor, I get to be a lifelong student and learn from people like these wonderful uh, gentlemen who joined us today. Um, I also want to say that I've been learning a lot about employee owned companies um, this week in these morning meetings I have with Anthony and different CEOs around um, Los Angeles and, and California. And it's really inspiring to hear how employees are making personal sacrifices in these cases and um, doing what is needed to be creative and innovative and applying a, an ownership mentality to the work they do. And I've, I've seen that happen here at LMU as well with our, with our team and our family coming together, creating programs like this. And so, you know, in times of struggle and times of chaos and uncertainty, uh, we have things to look forward to. And this is, this is really a talk that I hope will inspire you if you're a small business owner to think about what you can do for, to keep your legacy, but to also transfer the wealth that you've generated to folks who have not been able to have that. Um, and, and these employee owners um, and other future owners, you know, this is the American dream. This is what, what, you know, what distinguishes us from other countries. And if we can create more opportunities for people to be entrepreneurs and own pieces of companies that they work for, we're gonna see creativity and innovation on levels that you can't even imagine right now. So I want to thank everybody for being a part of this talk uh, and, and please stay in touch. Uh, if, you, if you're an audience, uh, if you contact us. We'll, we'll post this video live, share it around. Anybody you know who's considering short, shutting their doors, put them in touch with these guys. We want to save these companies and, fi and find ways to keep them in our community. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jason. And thank you so much to our panelists. Um, please join us for our next webinar next Tuesday, August 25th with our professor, Ellen Ensher as we discuss breaking up with bad breakouts. So for those of you who are teaching or in training or setting up a fun happy hour, this may be a webinar for you. So again, thank you for joining us today and for hanging out a little bit after one. Um, otherwise, we are done and thank you to everyone for joining us. Sign off. Bye.